Well, guys, I'm having an absolutely disastrous time trying to record this sermon. I think there's about take uh, 27 at the moment. All the others have been complete rubbish. It is nice to be talking to you again and sharing from God's word, although, frankly, it's much harder and uh, I miss being able to see your faces as I speak to you. Preaching a virtual sermon to a computer screen just is not the same. Well, the message that I want to bring is one that's been on my heart for a few weeks now. I had planned to preach it twice, once to the filling station box last week, and then today for you guys with a few minor tweaks. So I'm going to offer apologies in advance because a number of you who've already heard it, you've tuned into the uh, um, filling station website and, uh, and heard it. You can switch off now if you like. I shan't be upset. Although, actually, one of the elders in our church in Toaster used to listen to my sermons on the way to work in his car. And he always reckoned that they were better the second time round. So see what you think about that one. At any rate, I'm offering apologies, but sadly, there are no refunds, if you've heard this before. The sermon's about hope, which I, I think is something that is hugely relevant to us right now. And my reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is what Paul writes. What I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that is to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, many of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. So Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of their dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you turned up on Easter Saturday with the bedraggled remnants of the Jesus movement, you'd not have found very much hope. For the disciples and the friends of Jesus, the world as they knew it had just come to an end. Their hopes had been invested in Jesus of Nazareth and they had all come crashing down. The hopes for their nation, their own lives, the future. 24 hours, cruel hours from Thursday night into Friday afternoon. The hopes have been trampled into the dust. A corrupt, self-serving, lying, power-hungry elite had engineered the crucifixion of the healer. Evil had triumphed. Those disciples are weighed down with a devastating mix of personal grief, utter shock, total disillusion. There's nothing to say anymore, nowhere to go. They're feeling utterly numb. Indeed, even on Easter Sunday when we meet them again, they're still without hope. The group of women who head down to Jesus' tomb have no greater ambition than to show their final respects and to seek some kind of closure. Cleopas and his friends 
trudging off to Emmaus. They've given up. They're going home to rebuild what they can of their shattered lives. The 11 disciples in their upper room, they're self-isolating, yet they're in lockdown that is born of the terrible fear that those who killed Jesus might now be coming for them. Right now, I'm guessing that there's a lot of folks who could empathize with all of that. Last year seemed bad enough, didn't we? Didn't it? We, we had that Brescott fiasco in the Parliament and we thought that was bad enough. But of course, now we've got wall to wall Corona headlines and it's far worse. Saw a cartoon in the paper the other day, um, two old geezers together, and one of them says to the other, My goodness, don't you miss Brexit? <laughs> well, it was Terry who reminded us a few weeks ago. Hi, Terry. That back in the day, Corona was that nice man bringing fizzy drinks round in his lorry. Well, Corona today is a very different matter. It's definitely lost its fizz. Today, Corona is people who've lost their jobs, businesses going bust, NHS staff and care workers rushed at their feet, trying to help others all the while putting themselves in danger. It's parents trying to work from home, surrounded by screaming kids. It's families trapped in inner city tenement buildings. It's older, more vulnerable people like ourselves, isolated in our own homes, wondering if and when it might be our turn to be struck down. It's the leader of our nation and a hospital intensive care bed fighting for his life, as he was just a week or two back. And then once all of this is over, there'll be a hugely deep damaging worldwide recession uh, economically, and it, it may take a generation to recover from it. It'd be easy to pick up a sense of panic from the news headlines and the endless TV coverage to feel hopeless, alone, and frankly, pretty worried. In effect, we're living as if it's Easter Saturday. Except, of course, as Christians, we're not on Easter Saturday. We don't need to be stuck there anymore. That's not where we live. Tony Campolo has a sermon that's entitled, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And uh, he's looking at the world and at our lives right now. He's seeing some of the tragedy, the despair, the sheer evil that characterized that day when Jesus was murdered. And he's saying, yes, this is real enough, but it ain't the last word. Because Sunday is coming, Resurrection Day, the day when all wrongs are righted, when despair is turned to joy, the day when the Lord comes in glory. Really, that's very much the message of 1 Corinthians 15. This time in our lives feels to many people like a very dark Friday, but Sunday is coming and it makes all the difference. And in particular, there are five great trumpet blasts of hope the sounding here. First of all, sin is dealt with. Okay, so that might sound to some people more like a squeak than a trumpet blast. Sin probably isn't right at the top of most people's anxiety list right now. But just for a moment, forget about coronavirus. Most of the things that are wrong in our world are because of the wrong choices we make and the wrong things that we do. They're because of something inside each one of us that is deeply messed up. We're a bit like cars where the steering has gone. You know, a car with dodgy steering, you might be able to control it to some degree, but leave it to itself and it's always going to veer off into a ditch or into a lamppost or something. This twistedness inside us is what the Bible calls sin. Sin rejects God and his authority. It cuts us adrift from our creator. And each of us lives with the consequences of that. The war inside our heads between what we are and what we know we should be. The regrets and guilt as we consider our past. The broken relationships that we come up against as we reach out to others. But above all, there's a broken relationship with God which we can't repair. Sin, the Bible tells us, is a sentence of death forever. And so actually, it, at every time and in every circumstance, being forgiven from our sin and being accepted into God's family is 
wonderfully good news, including, of course, now. Jesus' death on the cross achieves it. The resurrection declares it because Jesus died for our sins and came back from the dead loving us. We can be sure beyond doubt that in Jesus our sin is well and truly dealt with. And as we trust in him, we're fully accepted by God. Now that might not be the most dramatic trumpet blast of hope. But let me tell you, it's the foundation for everything that follows. Secondly, heaven is open. You know, people in difficult circumstances sometimes ask the question, where's God? Where's God? Well, the answer is, he's right here. You see, Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us is what that means. Because of Jesus, heaven has been opened to us. You can see that right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he's baptized. And when he is baptized, we're told that he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. God has come near in Christ. Then you fast forward to the end of the gospel story. On the morning of resurrection, Jesus meets up with Mary Magdalene, has this message for his disciples. Tell them, he says, tell them I'm descending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. The open heaven is now ours. We can have that same relationship to God, our father, that Jesus experienced on earth. Through the Holy Spirit, God is delighted to open up to us his presence, his love, his power, himself. Which means that we're no longer alone. We're no longer isolated. You know, there on the Easter Sunday at the 11 disciples, they're locked away in their room. They're self-isolating because they're fearful of what the Jewish authorities might do to them. But social isolation doesn't shut out the Lord Jesus. Walls, locked doors, irrelevant. They don't keep him out. Nobody's unlocked that bolt. Nobody's lifted the latch. But suddenly there's Jesus right in the middle of the room with them. Locked down does not lock out the Lord. You know, I became a Christian for the first time nearly 58 years ago now. And the padre at our crusader camp that I went to had been a missionary to Tibet. And then the communist Chinese marched in. And uh, this guy, Jeff Bull, he was captured, he was brainwashed, he was subjected to all kinds of mistreatment. Most of the time, for month after month, he was held in an isolation cell. But I've heard this guy and I've read his books, and for this man entirely on his own in a seemingly hopeless situation, every page, every day is filled with the sense of the presence of Christ. Locked doors could not keep God out. Everything else was closed to him, but heaven was open. In the words of the song, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. And it's a thought, of course, that is lifted straight out of Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, powers, height, depth, not anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heaven is open. Third trumpet blast is the powers of evil have been broken. You know, ranged against Jesus on the cross were all kinds of powers. There was the power of Rome's domineering imperial might. There was the prejudice of a power-hungry set of religious leaders. There was the hatred of small minds and closed hearts. There was the indifference of Pontius Pilate and his professional soldiers, for whom Jesus was no more than mere collateral damage. Behind all of that, there is the evil and the fury of hell. Well, the resurrection of Jesus shouts out to us that they lost and Jesus won. In the words of Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, on the cross, Christ defeated all powers and forces. He let the whole world see them being led away as prisoners when he celebrated his victory. Almost Jesus' last words on this earth were, 
all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Paul reflects that great truth in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 25. He must reign until he has put all his enemies, all his enemies under his feet. So what does this say to us in our situation? You know, there's a phrase that comes over and over again in the old authorised version of the Bible. You'd be very familiar with it. It came to pass. And actually, really, only that phrase means it happens. doesn't mean any more than that. But you can also take those words as being literally true. Coronavirus, illness, money troubles, family troubles and all the rest of it. It comes, it will pass. None of it is forever. None of that is the last word. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the things that we see are temporary, the things that we don't see are eternal. All the pain, all the mess of today falls under that phrase, it came to pass. And this should change our, our mindset radically. We talk about people and things being under the circumstances, don't we? How are you? under the circumstances well under the circumstances we're not doing too badly oh i'm bearing up under the circumstances hey let me tell you as christians we are not under circumstances we're not defined by our circumstances we are under the sovereign care of our creator we're under the unshakable promises of a heavenly father we are under the redeeming blood of christ we are under the unwavering protection of the holy spirit we are not under the circumstances because the powers of evil have been broken forever in the cross and resurrection of jesus fourth trumpet blast of hope is god's new creation has begun you've probably seen those rainbows in people's windows haven't you i like them the nice, cheery, colourful expressions of hope. Always look on the bright side of life. All very nice. As Christians, however, the rainbow carries a far more powerful message than that. The rainbow appears in Genesis 9 after the Great Flood. The world as people had known it had been swept away, but the rainbow appears in the clouds and God says, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. It's a sign of covenant. After the cataclysm is over, God is still there. He is still committed to his creation. He's still ready to build a new world. And the rainbow is a sign of God's love, God's promise, God's new creation. After the cataclysm of the cross, the resurrection of Jesus carries much the same message. New creation is coming into being in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 puts it like this, as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. An old creation is dying, it's come to an end. But a new creation has begun in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Where's it going to end? What's the, what's the destiny of all of this? Well, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, God made known to us the mystery of his will, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment to bring unity to everything in heaven and on earth under Christ. One day, in other words, everything is going to come together in and under the Lord Jesus. Now, in this world, we don't know what's going to happen to it. It appears that in the best possible scenario, the sun is going to expand one day and incinerate all of us. In roughly seven and a half billion years time, they say, so we've got a little bit of time still left. If you listen to mainstream science, it seems very possible that we will actually make the Earth uninhabitable very much sooner than that, perhaps within several generations. Here's the thing. When this world is no more, God's promise in Christ is a new heavens and a new Earth. 
a new creation with no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, but absolutely saturated with the presence of our loving God. When a woman goes into labour, there's often a mixture of emotions, isn't there? There's, of course, apprehension. It's, it's a difficult, very painful, sometimes a, a rather dangerous time. But I think very often our overriding feeling is one of excitement because a new life is coming into being. So it is with the world. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus outlines a pretty difficult, painful future. A future when, he says, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what's coming on the world. Time actually far worse than anything that we're experiencing. But for God's people, that's never going to be a reason to despair, because the pains are not the death throes of everything, but they're the labour pains, they're the birth pangs, if you like, of God's new creation. And Jesus goes on to say, when you see these things begin to take place, look up, for your redemption is near. Don't look down, look up. God's new creation has begun. And we're going to be part of it. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable. We will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Fabulous. And that brings us to the fifth great trumpet blast of hope, which is that death is defeated. In verse 19 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, if only for this life we have in hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And I suppose that's true actually for anyone whose hope is bounded by life here and now. Actually, for most of the people around us, their hopes are actually only for this life. And sometimes their response to a coronavirus is one that verges on panic. For them, death is a sentence that hangs over every joy, every hope, every achievement, every relationship that they've got. It is the full stop at the end of all hope. Well, because of Jesus, we are not in that place. In the aftermath of Easter, death is not yet destroyed, but it is already defeated. It is no longer the last word. If you're a Christian, it just means that actually we're going to meet God a little bit earlier than we had been expecting. No big deal. Now, I'm not sure that I'm entirely logical about this, but on the whole, I'd rather not die just yet. That's a personal thing. I'd like to see the grandchildren grow up. I'd like to think that Sue needs me, although actually probably she doesn't. In actual fact, in saying that, you know, I'm being a little bit greedy. After all, I have already outlived almost all my ancestors. Sue and I visited a uh, museum in Tetbury. They had records from the 17th century and the records featured, quote, an exceptionally old man. He was 67. Well, <laughs> I've beaten him already. In these coming months, I may die. So may you. But if we do, it isn't the end of our world. I don't expect that the love of God that's held me for the last 57 years is about to drop me when I breathe my last breath. I serve a risen saviour. I expect to live again with him. And actually it's better than that because Paul in 1 Corinthians tells us that death in Christ is like a dry wrinkled seed falling into the ground and then in the springtime, in God's springtime, emerging as a glorious bloom or a majestic tree. What he's saying is we will be wonderfully transformed. We die perishable, but we're raised imperishable. Our old decaying body dies, but we live again ageless. And if death is the worst that can happen to us through this coronavirus or anything else, this is fabulously good news. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, 
and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Well, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what? What are we supposed to do with this? I want to encourage us to do two things with it. First of all, let's encourage our own hearts. Let's feed our souls with God's life-giving truth. Let's look up instead of looking down. But then secondly, let's be beacons of hope in our world. People have, of course, all kinds of needs at a time like this. They have uh, needs for practical help, all the things that the NHS and the essential services provide. They need that. They need compassion. And, and hasn't it been brilliant to see ways that people are caring for each other in the current situation? They need humour and a bit of light relief, I guess. I love the rainbows. I love people who make me laugh in this situation. I'll tell you what people are gasping for. They're gasping for hope. And we've got that in Christ. We've got it in spades. And these are days when we have a special opportunity to live that hope. And as we get the chance also to speak it into the lives of those around us. These are times when we meet people still in the shops. We meet people in the streets, and although we can't get all that close, my experience is that people speak to us much more than they used to. You might have carers who come in. You might speak to family. We have opportunities to share the hope that is in us. As I encourage each of us to do that, let me just lead us in a prayer and then uh, we'll close. Father God, as we look at our world, there is plenty to make us feel negative but as we remember the death and the resurrection of the lord jesus christ we're reminded that there is a whole heap of glorious hope in which we live here thank you lord jesus that in you we have the forgiveness of sins in you we have an open heaven in you evil is defeated in you a new creation has begun in you, death is a busted flush. Its days are numbered. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring home to us your truth so that we are empowered to live with compassion, with joy, and with a Christ-given confidence. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And by your grace, use our lives and our words to speak into the lives of our families, our carers, the people we meet in the supermarkets, the folks we encounter on the streets at suitable arm's length, with indeed all of those who share our lives, that Christ will be made known and will be glorified. And we pray that in his glorious name. Amen.